where the human race began. Nearly a billion people live here. And it's a continent with an incredible diversity of communities and cultures. Yet we know less of its history than almost anywhere else on Earth. But that's beginning to change. In the last few decades, researchers and archaeologists have begun to uncover a range of histories as impressive and extraordinary as anywhere else on Earth. It's a history which has been neglected for years, and it's largely without written records. But it is preserved for us in the gold and statues, in the culture, art and legends of the people. My name is Gus Casely Hayford. Over many years, I've studied the history and culture of Africa. As an art historian, I'm used to drawing stories from mute objects from the past. I'm going to discover the history and find out what really happened to the lost kingdoms of Africa. I'm beginning my search in the far north of the continent, in what is now known as the Sudan. I'm looking for the legendary kingdom of Nubia. Nubia is the traditional name for the northern part of Sudan, near the Egyptian border. For thousands of years, a civilization dominated the area there, in what's now the Eastern Sahara. It's first mentioned by the ancient Egyptians as a primitive outpost, a source of slaves and treasure, dancing girls and restless. To the Romans too, it was a barbarian wasteland. Yet these people were conquerors in their own right, ultimately defeated not by their rivals, but by their environment. Nubia has left us some of the most spectacular monuments, not only in Africa, but in the whole world. There are more pyramids here than there are in Egypt. This was a major civilization, but its history is barely remembered. So what was Nubia actually like? How powerful was it? And what happened to it in the end? To begin my search, I'm leaving the Sudanese capital Khartoum and flying north into Nubia. This is every schoolboy's dream. This ancient old helicopter is going to take us up to see some of the ancient Nubian sites. I've got this fantastic guide here. This is Mahmoud. It's going to help to tell me what some of the sites mean. Mahmoud Bashir is one of Sudan's most respected archaeologists. He's taking me on a journey, not just through space, but time, going back nearly 10,000 years, to the time when humans first began to plant crops and to keep domestic animals. We're going northwards along the Nile. If it weren't for the Nile and its irrigation, this whole scene would be desert. And from the air, it's easy to see how narrow the cultivation strip really is. But Mahmoud tells me we're going to leave the green corridor of the Nile and head out into the desert proper. Out here is one of the toughest places on Earth. The temperature here is more than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And yet there are still people working here. This is where I'm going to start my journey, right in the back of beyond. We've flown more than 250 miles north from Khartoum into the middle of the Nubian desert. 15,000 square miles of arid sandstone with scarcely a single oasis. From here, we're going to drive across the scorching sands. And Mahmoud tells me we're going to start with the very beginnings of Nubian culture, more than 7,000 years ago. Oh, 
it's hot. It's baking. <laughs> what are you doing today? I can't believe we've come out here. It must, it feels like the middle of nowhere. It's one of the driest, most remote places I've ever been. But Mahmoud says that here, there's something that makes all the suffering we've gone through really worthwhile. So let's have a look. But why did you bring me out here? Actually, because this is a, it's a very important place, and here actually where our story will begin. Something interesting. Oh, it's a bell. It's an old bell. What? It's what we call the rock gong. So, how old is this, Mahmoud? It's not less than five thousand. Five thousand years. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I'm playing a 5000 BC instrument. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the actual sound is the natural result of the consistency of the rock, but it's been worn smooth by the actions of people playing it more than 7000 years ago, long before the Romans, long before the pharaohs. This is a sign of human civilization. So would they sing along to this? Imagine more dancing than singing. More dancing. Mm. In the last few years, archaeologists have found hundreds of rock gongs like this in the Nubian desert. Possible evidence of a sizable population. I imagine you'd be able to hear it from a long distance. From a long, a long distance, and I think, and we think actually it's uh, the same as what we have now about the drum language in Africa. Yes. It's probably the, it was doing the same function at that time. Archaeologists think that people here may have used the rock gongs to communicate across the valleys. And that this is the beginning of the Nubian culture. But why here? This is the middle of one of the harshest deserts in the world. Mahmoud has something to show me. It's been a secret until recently. So now I will show you a very special thing. Oh, have a look at it. Oh, wow. That's amazing, it's cattle. Yeah. And that, how old is that? Something like 5,000, 6,000 BC. <gasps> BC! 5,000, 6,000. It's just astounding. When, when were these discovered? Uh, it's uh, just last March, can you imagine? <laughs> last like, March? Uh, we are in August. Five, so not many five, people five have seen it? Yes, you are the, uh, the second after the, the mission who discovered the site. Really? Really. You are the second really? to be here. Rock art is the oldest form of pictorial representation known. Research has shown that the pictures are unlikely to be just a depiction of everyday life. Instead, they concentrate on subjects that are of great significance to the people who made them. So I'm amazed to discover that out here, deep in the Nubian desert, they should be making images of cattle. But this is desert, though. But it uh, was in the desert uh, in seven or uh, 6,000 uh, BC. Mahmoud tells me it's a story of catastrophic climate change. Recent research has shown that some 7,000 years ago, most of the Sahara was in fact green. You can see the outlines of dry valleys or wadis. They were once big rivers which flowed into the Nile. And between them stretched grassland savannas of the kind that you have to go much further south to see today. So this area here, once upon a time would have had grass in it, it would have been lush, it would have supported cattle and probably complex communities as Yes, well. and even wild animals. What, what kind of animals it might have been? Yeah, actually, based on the rock drawings we have around here, we have uh, lions, we have uh, elephants, we have giraffes. So the, the 
the wildlife and the ecology of sub-Saharan Africa yeah. once existed. It, yes. That's amazing. Mm. And this is the proof of that. Yeah. So you can imagine sort of the cattle, mm -hmm. well, with a stretch of the imagination, the cattle in this valley, mm. the river just down there. Yes, yes. Mm. And people, someone at some point coming up here mm. and with one of these stones just and making this. The big thing, all these uh, kind of uh, drawings. Yes. It's an amazing game. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Maybe the same people who play the, the rock gong are the same who depict these uh, drawings here. It took thousands of years for the desert to dry out completely. So the cattle herding or pastoralist society which created the rock art was able to develop into a much more complex community. And I'm told that they produce something quite spectacular. And that's where I'm headed for now. We're pushing northwards along the Nile, some 700 miles from Khartoum and less than 200 from the Egyptian border. Our destination is the small town of Kerma, which sits by the Nile. This was once the capital of the kingdom which the Egyptians knew as Kush. This was the heart of the kingdom of Nubia. Over the last few decades, archaeologists have uncovered the remains of an impressive city here, dating from around 2000 BC. This extraordinary structure looms like a man-made mountain over the ruins. Karma, it's kind of a development of the community who make the rock art. So we have here like more organization. At the heart of this great city was a huge mud brick structure known as the Dufufa. It's the oldest known mud brick building in Africa and one of the largest. But it has no rooms. It's a solid block of masonry. They've actually built a piece of geography because it's absolutely solid mud. And what, what, what is it? And what, what might it have been used for? I believe that it's something associated with rituals. It's something like a temple or something like this. We don't know who the god or gods were that these people worshipped, but according to Mahmud, it was the temple on the top of the Dafufa which was the main focus here. It was surrounded by palaces for royalty or priests. Now we are on the top of the Dafufa. Yes. And uh, you can see around surrounding the Dafufa is the administration city of Karma. So these are the these raised are foundations the, of yes, the foundation of the buildings they I see. had been found here and uh, this kind of a reconstruction of the foundation to show us the, the plans of this building. I see. Judging by the buildings that the archaeologists have uncovered in the last 10 years, Kerma was not so much a residential city as a place of pilgrimage where people would come from miles around for ceremonies. Then of course it would have looked very different. And it's easy to forget, but all of this was really green. Yes, it's more green and uh, it's, it's surrounded by green and so there is enough food, enough water. And so it could have been a fairly wealthy area. It's really developed a very strong kingdom at that time. Mm. So all these uh, economical sources supported the, the state to be a very strong uh, state. There's a small museum here with some of the finds from the excavations which give a flavour of the Nubian culture. And even when it's laid out like this, with the artefacts numbered off and catalogued, you can see quite how distinctive it is. Take the pottery. Archaeologists now know that people were making pottery here even before they began to plant crops, and long before ancient Egypt. The polished surfaces and black rims imitate the forms of polished drinking gourds I've seen and used elsewhere in Africa. It's extremely finely made, but it's done entirely by hand. They weren't using a potter's wheel for this. And the extraordinary thing is that this technique can still be found today 
4,000 years on. Everywhere you go around here, you see these characteristic water jars. They aren't mass-produced in a factory. Instead, they're made by women in a local village. Just gathering some um, go poo, I think it is, which apparently is used in the mixture with the clay. And this is a village across the Nile from where we've been staying, where they create these amazing clay pots and we're being shown by one of the local women how they actually do that from the point of kneading the clay to the finished product. I've done some pottery myself and I know from hard experience that this technique is actually extremely difficult. It's as sophisticated as the mud brick architecture of the Dufufa. This technique may be ancient but it's perfectly adapted to the conditions here. The red slip is designed to get the surface of the pot just right, porous enough for slow evaporation to keep the contents cool. <laughs> These continuities of tradition and practice are an even more important insight into the culture of ancient Nubia, because the Nubians of Kerma never developed writing. But archaeology has revealed some more astonishing insights into this ancient city. This is where the Nubians of Kerma buried their dead. The cemetery was first excavated by an American-led team in 1913. What they uncovered told an astonishing story. We are in the, what we call is the Eastern Cemetery. This is a cemetery belong to the Karma. We're standing on the edge of what was once an enormous funeral mound, nearly a hundred meters across. The center's marked by a mysterious white rock, and there's a kind of smooth avenue which crosses the space. It's a huge area and it seems to be the burial mound of a king. But he wasn't buried alone. Within this, we have the, the human sacrifices human. inside. And so you can see the importance of the person has been uh, buried so how, here. How, how many people were sacrificed? More than 300 persons no. has been buried as a human sacrifice. The archaeologists think that the victims, men, women, and children too, were sacrificed to provide servants and retainers for their master in the life beyond. The vast cemetery itself was used for over a thousand years and contains over 30,000 graves. It must have been quite an eerie and melancholy place. I mean, if anything is going to really make you think about life and, and death, it's, it's, it's a place it's, it's like this. Archaeologists have also found something which ties Kerma directly to the people of the rock art. Cattle. Around the, the, on the edges of the, of the mound, yes. uh, 5,000 uh, cattle skulls has been found on this uh, edge of the tomb. So this would be a king or something? I mean, 5,000 cattle yes, but, uh, would have... I mean, were these cattle that were slaughtered especially for... Yes. To as commemorate a, as the, part the of death the, of this person? Exactly, and it's part of the offering has been offered with this uh, person. Wealth is measured mm. in cattle. Yes. During that time, yes, absolutely yes. And uh, cattle was the, just the main thing. We can find that in, in the karma culture in many aspects. But if that many cattle, that many people are being sacrificed for one person, one, it suggests they were incredibly powerful, mm. and two, that there must have been an enormous cattle culture here and probably a big population that that supported. I mean, that really does get me thinking in a different way about Kerma. I mean, this was an enormous civilization. It's a real king kingdom. 
The scale and relative sophistication of the Nubian civilization here in Kerma led Western archaeologists in colonial Sudan to assume that this culture must have been brought in from Egypt or elsewhere. But now it's believed that this was an indigenous development, a civilization created by the descendants of the people who created the rock art. Four thousand years after it was built, the people of Kerma still gather like ghosts around the temple at the Dufufa. Although the Nubian kingdom is long gone, it still exerts a pull. And these ruins have really affected me. In a sense, Kerma is the lost kingdom that I'd always dreamt of seeing. It's every bit as spectacular as anything that I've seen in Egypt. Four thousand years ago, the Nubians of Kerma were apparently thriving with their great mud brick monument, their herds of cattle and a sizable population. So why did they disappear and where did they go? Water was the key to this Nubian kingdom. It provided the lush, fertile land on which their cattle herding society was based. It was a different story for Nubia's northern neighbors, the Egyptians. Their lack of pastoral land had led to the development of irrigation technology, drawing as much water as they could from the Nile to transform their parched desert soil. But even with this technology, it was a lot harder for them to create the rich greenery that Nubia had at this time in abundance, thanks to the rivers which ran through it. Nubia was a tempting target for the ambitious pharaohs. There were frequent raids and retaliations. Then, around 1500 BC, the records show us that the Egyptians invaded. Their target wasn't just Kerma. They continued another 180 miles along the Nile to a place called Jebel Barkal. Mahmoud and I are following the Egyptians' invasion route up the River Nile. Our objective is the same as the ancient pharaohs, the apparently symbolic mountain of Jebel Barkal. You can see that the, there is also a kind of feature on the mountain itself, like uh, this very interesting pinnacle here. If you can just see from the top, like a crown on the head of a cobra. Uh, I'm not seeing I a did. cobra, I must admit. You can, you... Can, you can see just, if you look at the pinnacle, on the top, this is a, like a crown, That's it, okay. and you can see just beneath the, like uh, this size, <laughs> you can see a mouse of a cobra, and even you can, if you concentrate, you oh, can I'm see like a part it. of the eye. I think, so we're looking at something which is sitting like that, and you can imagine a sort of exactly. dancing exactly. cobra, exactly. and on its head, yes, that and there's a crown. Wearing a crown, long crown. Then I this see is it. a crown of the, the kingship. I see it. To the ancient Egyptians, the rearing cobra was a symbol of kingship. And here was a natural sculpture which signaled to them, it seems, that within the mountain dwelt Amun, king of the Egyptian gods. They felt that justified their conquest of Nubia. And so they built an enormous temple to Amun at the foot of the mountain. How did the Nubians feel about the Egyptians actually being here? At that time, the Nubia was uh, completely uh, controlled by the Egyptian. It does seem a little bit like colonialism. 
Exactly. It's uh, for the, at that time for uh, the Egyptian, just looking at the Nubian as a, as a barbaric savage. Egyptian images at the time of the conquest are explicit about the subjugation of the Nubian people. They clearly regarded them as inferior. The Egyptians they used to call uh, Nubia before, uh, during that time as uh, the, the miserable Nubia. Miserable Nubia. Yeah. The images also make it clear that the Egyptians made the most of Nubia's natural resources and demanded riches as well as respect. Here the Nubians are bringing tribute, gold, ivory, along with wild animals, monkeys and leopard skins. And of course cattle are prominent. They even seem to have imported Nubian wrestlers to entertain them like gladiators. The people who built Kerma's magnificent buildings had it seemed been reduced to slaves. Or certainly that's what the Egyptians wanted everyone to think. There's a suggestion that even the name by which we know them is pejorative. The word Nuba originally meant slave. It's clear that whatever their justification, the Egyptians claimed Jebel Barkal as a holy place. What's amazing is that more than 3,000 years later, it still is. This evening, Mahmoud and I have come here to share the devotions of a local Sufi Muslim sect. They honor the memory of a local sheikh who's buried in a shrine at the foot of the holy mountain. Sufi mystics were instrumental in the conversion of Sudan to Islam in the Middle Ages. In the process, they adapted and made use of local cultural customs. So although this ceremony is clearly Islamic, it's likely that it contains glimpses of far more ancient religious observances from this area. And in the clearer light of dawn, seeing the Egyptian temple and the Sufi shrine from the top of the mountain, I'm struck by the continuities which seem to persist. History piled upon history here. You can just feel it's one of those special places. And it sets me thinking back about those gongs. Hearing those Sufis, those repeated rhythms, it gives you a sense of the way in which those repetitions of prayers, of incantations, of thoughts, reflect back over generations, over millennia, but in some way are still very special to the people of this land today. The Egyptians had painted the Nubians as mere slaves. What Mahmoud wants to show me is that the story isn't so simple. It's just astoundingly hot today. Apparently it's above 50 degrees and I've never experienced it before, but it gets above 50 in this environment and it's no longer just hot from the sun. It just feels like it's coming at you from every direction. The Egyptians only ruled Nubia for just a few centuries. And there's hard evidence that the Nubians are able to get their own back on their conquerors. 
But surrounded by all these massive Egyptian remains, I find that hard to believe. Mahmoud says that if I had any lingering doubt that the Nubians turned the tables on the Egyptians, that that would be completely extinguished by having a look at what's in here. temple, apparently built by a Nubian ruler called Taharqa in around 700 BC. If you can see here, depiction of the holy mountain, Jabal Barqa, with the pinnacle on the shape of cobra oh, with the sun disk. On. So that, that is where we actually sat, just yes. under, at the bottom of and that And that's mountain. exactly where we are now here, just beneath, on the, beneath the pinnacle itself, here inside the mountain. And we have here Amun, depiction of Amun. Actually in, inside? The inside the mountain, dueling. In here? Yes. And Gosh. in front of it, we have the Harka, giving offering to Amun. So Taharka representing the people here? Yes. But what these images show is that Taharqa wasn't just a ruler of Nubia, he was also a pharaoh of Egypt. The conquered had become the conquerors. He was one of a whole dynasty of Nubian pharaohs, which ruled over the entire Nile Valley under the auspices of Amun. And uh, Taharqa wearing the crown with uh, two cobras, which means that he is the king of the two lands. Wow, astonishing. Yeah. Because usually these things are so ambiguous and that you have to make a bit of a leap of faith with history or archaeology. Yeah. This is absolutely categorical. And suddenly I'm seeing that snake again. These are black pharaohs, Nubians, part of that lost kingdom of Nubia. But they didn't just rule over Nubia, they also ruled over Egypt as one continuous kingdom. These hieroglyphs show how Taharqa celebrated his joint Nubian-Egyptian kingdom in the sanctuary of this temple. On the one side, he depicted the Nubian gods and there is a wall here. With the Egyptian deities on the other. This black African civilization held sway from the upper Nile all the way to the Lebanon for over a century. These statues, discovered only a few years ago, give us a portrait of the Nubian pharaohs in all of their self-confidence. These people ruled the whole area from here down in the Nubian territory right the way up into Egypt. And you can tell that by looking at their headdress. These two snakes, one for Nubia, one for Egypt. And you can tell how threatening they were to the Egyptians because they've all at some point had their heads knocked off. Just look at them. And though they were unable to keep their hold on Egypt, the Nubian kingdom survived for centuries afterwards. But now they had acquired some Egyptian habits. From this time onward, Nubian rulers would be buried in pyramids like the pharaohs of old. There are more pyramids in Sudan than in Egypt. But this wasn't simple imitation. It had been centuries since Egyptian rulers used pyramids, and these pyramids are of a very different shape. This was the Nubians celebrating their own glory. But the Nubians had another greater enemy than the Egyptians, the environment. At the time of Taharqa, around 700 BC, the archaeological records show that the desert was approaching ever closer, and Kerma itself had lost its grazing land. The pressure of the desert meant that the heartland of the Nubian kingdom 
now move further south, another 350 miles along the Nile, around a place called Meroe. Today, the desert here is littered with the remains of pyramids and temples. The society that built them flourished between 700 BC and 400 AD. The rebirth of the Nubian kingdom at Meroe, still green and lush back then, is marked by countless palaces and temples. And although the Egyptians had left their mark on the Nubian culture, there's evidence here also of more ancient Nubian beliefs. I can see the Egyptian influence in the shape of this temple. But the relief sculpture on the walls expressed a decidedly un-Egyptian worldview. By 200 BC, the Egyptian god Horus has been demoted to the back of the line. So this is in the line of seniority? Exactly. Even the great Amun of Jebel Barkul is playing second fiddle to the completely non-Egyptian war god, Apodemak. He's more senior, shown presenting the sign of kingship to the Nubian ruler. And there's another way that Nubians held on to their traditions from before. Mahmud has brought me to one of the most spectacular sites in Sudan, the royal cemetery itself. where the Nubian kings of this period were buried in their distinctive pyramids. There's evidence of a return to their traditional way of life, where one thing was of the utmost importance. You can see this line of uh, cattles, two lines, one of on the top, one of the bottom of the wall. So there's a whole row of, of cattle? Of cattle, yes. Just going from, yes. from right to yes. left? And you can see the, in the iconography itself, the, the scale of the people and the scale of the cows. So they are more concentrating on the cows. To so, so the thing that they value is obviously yes, cattle. exactly. And the whole of their social world is, can be translated and into value through cattle. And, and connected also is cattle as a, uh, as a major part in this life, I think that. Oh, amazing. So, in a sense, they're does seem to be a link between kingship and cattle, something quite fundamental. Uh, probably yes, because uh, as far as we saw now in uh, here at Marawi and uh, at Karma, uh, the connection is cattle and the, they keep uh, representing cattle in their uh, iconography here in all the, the things connected with life and life after death. 700 years after they were subjected to Egyptian domination, the Nubians of Meroe were still a distinct and African culture, a heritage that still connects them to African cultures today. It's time to leave the ruins and head to the inhabited part of Meroe. We're off to the royal city of Meroe and they've supplied some fantastic transport. Modern Meroe is where Mahmoud carries out his main research. His speciality is the history of the iron trade, and many of the old techniques survive unchanged. So for thousands of years, people yeah. have been Forging, forging, smelting, metal. using the same technique. Really? The Nubians are thought to have developed the earliest iron industry in Africa. The first iron technology appeared here during the first millennium BC, around the same time as our own Iron Age. A number of the archaeologists, they believe that the 
knowledge of uh, producing iron. It has been uh, invented here, here in uh, Tamarawi, and then spread to the rest of Africa. And even uh, some of them, they go further and they uh, call uh, Marawi as the Birmingham of uh, ancient <laughs> Africa. <laughs> The archaeology shows us that Meroe became a relatively large industrial center, producing vast amounts of iron. For a thousand years after the loss of the Egyptian kingdom, the Nubians of Meroe flourished. By the second century BC, they'd even developed writing. But whilst archaeologists long ago decoded the sounds of the alphabet, no one has yet cracked the language itself. This was a confident, independent civilization, far from the barbarian wilderness described by the ancient writers, a place that was justly famed for its ironwork, its wrestlers, and its cattle. It's possible that the encroaching desert was their friend as well as their enemy, protecting them from another invasion from the north. But the desert continued its relentless incursion. It had long ago destroyed their civilization at Kerma. Now, too, the Nubians of Meroe saw their grazing lands disappearing. This land is just dry and desiccated. Nothing could grow here. But could you imagine actually having invested your livelihood in living here as a farmer just to see it all turn to dust? And you can imagine the people thinking this is just obviously something which might have been seasonal, perhaps a few dry summers or winters, and then it just lasted forever, changed the culture, changed the landscape, and eventually the people would have had to have given up. With the desert came one of the few animals to thrive in its conditions, the camel. They were first domesticated in Arabia about a thousand BC and took some time to reach Nubia. When they did, they eventually brought a nomadic way of life to the Eastern Sahara and everything changed. By the end of uh, the fourth century AD, the nomads around uh, all the tribe around uh, Meroe, they start to control the trade routes, making problem for the Merotic state. Mahmud believes it was the loss of its trade routes to camel-riding nomads which destroyed the Nubian kingdom at Meroe. Others debate this, but by 400 AD, archaeologists agree the ancient kingdom of Nubia was in terminal decline. The Nubian way of life had become impossible, but what became of the Nubian people? We're on our way south, and we're suddenly confronted by the new kings of the desert. It's an enormous camel train on its way, it seems, to the great camel markets of southern Egypt. Some of the guys who are on these trains, that they have fairly sort of dicey reputations. We're going to be OK, are we? Yes, uh, hopefully we should be OK. Uh, <laughs> we will uh, be very careful when we approach, uh, as you said, um, there have been some problems. There's someone under that tree there. When we meet up with the camel herders, we're given a friendly greeting. These men have traveled all the way from Darfur, near the border with Chad. They've covered more than 700 miles and have hundreds more to go. This is the way of life that now dominates the desert where once the Nubians ruled. Their days are spent guiding their camels from well to well, from oasis to oasis, but they don't seem to think it's any hardship. They said they are enjoying very much their trip and they don't feel like it's very uh, difficult or tough or something. They are enjoying the camels the same as the way we are enjoying these fancy cars. <laughs> <laughs> these men will travel 40 days at a time 
10 kilometers a day and rest when the sun is highest in the sky. But there are still small communities here, people who eke out a living off this harsh land. They too are dependent on the camel. Can we close now? Yes, we are almost there. We all miss. Right from here. I wonder if these people are among the descendants of the original Nubians. But where once their ancestors lived lives defined by lush grazing land, these people must cluster around small wells. I can do the pulling. But there's something quite sophisticated going on with the wrists. Which I think is probably avoiding it being tangled in this thing. Oh! Oh, and this, this is your well. <laughs> it's a sharp contrast to the pastoral way of life which once thrived here. And getting thirsty animals watered is laborious work. Wow. Well, I imagine it's going to take about ten of these to make any real decent sort of um, attempt on, on this. I imagine we've probably got our work cut out for the evening with this. This is a culture perfectly honed to the desert, but it isn't Nubian. To see if there are any traces of the old Nubian civilization, I'm going to have to head out of these desert zones further south. Central Sudan. And here is the landscape of ancient Nubia. It's just great to see this green environment. And it's just so reminiscent of what Kerma must have been like. Not just the housing, the farming technology, but just the landscape. This green landscape is just what it must have been like. Seven hundred miles south of Kerma, the land that still enjoys regular rainfall is sought after by pastoral communities. And the frontier between desert and green continues to be a source of conflict, just as it was for Egyptians and Nubians three and a half thousand years ago. These are UN vehicles going off to Darfur. I mean, it's fascinating that the same sorts of issues of food, resources, of power are still, in a way, the dynamic thing that infuses this landscape even today. A key component of the recent fighting in Darfur in Western Sudan was a dispute over lush, well-watered pastures. The same issues were a factor in the deadly civil war that engulfed southern Sudan for over 20 years. These lush green hills were recently a battleground. It's so glorious, so idyllic here. It's hard to believe that only a decade ago that this place was the site of a civil war. I was just wandering around just a few minutes ago and found a spent bullet case and there were dozens of them scattered across here. And it's not just a recent thing. Over centuries people had fought over this landscape. And in a sense the history, the story that we're telling is of that being replayed over centuries and centuries. The name of these hills reflects that history. These are the Nuba Hills, and the Nuba people believe that they are descended from the ancient kingdom of Nubia. I've come here with Shaza Rahal, educated in Britain, but a member of a traditional ruling family here. Hello. 
Her uncle, the leader of the village community, remembers the family traditions well. Anna, is me Mahmoud Ibrahim Toli. Toli the Jit. He comes from a royal family. They arrived um, many years ago. And many years ago, how many years might that be? Gubbal kam sana lamin da hasal. Al kalam da al harub bital al ma'al. This is roughly around 300 years ago. Their tradition says that they originally came from an area near Meroe, that ancient Nubian city, more than 500 miles away. I'm really keen to find out if there is a connection between mm. the people of this region, the Nuba, mm. and ancient of Nubia. Mm. I'm just really keen if this very much living place has a connection with that old mythology. <laughs> They're all the same people, they just separated. So there's some that stayed in Egypt, some stayed in, some came to Sudan. And Al Bagi Mashuwen? Al Bagi Fadaluen fi fi Marui. Fi Marui. The rest went to, stayed in Marui. The only difference between here and there you will see is the color of the skin. But in terms of the language, it's the same. The traditions are the same. Can there really be a connection between the people in this region and the ancient civilization of Nubia, born more than 7,000 years ago to the sound of a rock gong? The extraordinary thing is that although we're miles from ancient Nubian lands, there do seem to be some echoes of those far off times. Today, the young men still compete in what has become their most famous sport, wrestling. <laughs> the wrestling's in just the same style as in the pictures from 1500 BC that Mahmoud showed me at Jebel Barku. The same stars, the same grips even. Can I finally get to grips with this ancient civilization I've been searching for? I have to have a go. That's just amazing. But suddenly, I begin to realize this is just like those ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs of wrestlers. Just, just like. <laughs> of course, the similarities in style of their wrestling may be a coincidence. If there really is an inheritance from old Nubia, it should show up in more fundamental features of the Nuba way of life. Abdu, a cattle drover, certainly believes that the way of doing things hasn't changed in a long time. Yeah. Uh -huh. It has gone through tradition, through history, through uh -huh. family. Um, and from an early age, um, everyone is allocated a certain number of cows. Oh, really? Yes. So that they can raise them and they, they feed from them, like they use the milk from them to, to grow their children. Mm -hmm. um, and then they build on those. Um, so obviously then the more cows you have, the more wealth you have. So cattle are absolutely integral to 
to politics, to culture, to weaving the whole of this community together. Mm. Yes. Mm. There are cattle cultures like this one, right across Africa, from here in the hills of Sudan down to KwaZulu in South Africa. And so many of them are connected to kingship. It's possible that many of these stories may have begun in ancient Nubia, right the way back to the rock art people and Kerma. The Kambala is Anuba's most important dance. Its origins are in ceremonies which initiate young men as full members of Nuba society. These headdresses are made out of cattle skulls. And I'm struck by something. At Kerma, the great burial mound was surrounded by 5,000 cattle skulls just like these. Perhaps they were once the headdresses worn by dancers at the king's funeral. Who could fail to be convinced by this? I mean, this is those Kerma, those ancient Kerma cultures just brought to life. I mean, the cattle. I mean, you can just feel it. This is women singing about the cattle. This is men reliving those ancient traditions. This is absolutely everything that I've seen along the journey that made it alive in this incredible dance. Are these people the descendants of that ancient kingdom? There seems to be an inheritance expressed in traditions about cattle, about wrestling, and in legends about an ancient homeland. Beyond that, it's difficult to be certain of the links between the people of Nuba and those of ancient Nubia. But such a connection would only be icing on the cake. The most important thing is the weight of evidence we now have for the existence of Nubia as a remarkable, long-lasting, an indigenous kingdom. Nubia wasn't a barbarian wasteland on the fringes of civilization, as the Egyptians and Romans would have us believe. It was a real power, which developed independently and rivaled the pharaohs, a place with a distinctive way of life. In the end, it became a victim of climate change. But I think that Nubian ideas of power, wealth, and kingship continue to resonate in modern Africa. We're setting off on a journey of discovery in the wake of Egypt's first female ruler tomorrow here on BBC4. The pharaoh who conquered the sea is at nine 